Conversation with Ron McLean. Welcome to In Conversation. Today for our Friday, a very special golfing round table. And without getting too carried away, you can see, obviously, I love to read. I didn't as a boy, but I really love reading now. And two of my favorite influences are Shakespeare. Not that I read a lot of Shakespeare, uh, but Shakespeare taught the same way that a guy named Cervantes, the great Spaniard who wrote the first great novel, Don Quixote, they each revealed wisdom in their books through conversations. In the case of Shakespeare, as an example, Falstaff, uh, his helper, uh, Hamlet, would rely on him and they would chat. Same with the tete-a-tetes between Sancho Panza, the squire, to the errant knight, Don Quixote. That's where you found the pearls. And I've often thought in my life in sport broadcasting, the closest analogy between the wisdom of books and the wisdom in sport, where you have that relationship, would be in the relationship at golf. Uh, You think it's a solo actor out upon the stage, but in fact, uh, the real important wisdom is shared with the caddy. So that's just one of the dynamics I was hoping to explore here today. We're in this coronavirus where we're all trying to be good partners. I think we can glean a lot from uh, the guests we have here today. Great Canadian golfers, Laurie Kane, Mike Weir, Adam Hadwin, and I wrote the book on mental health, on walking the walk and talking the talk. As George Plimpton once wrote, the smaller the ball, the greater the sports writing. Adam Hadwin from British Columbia. The son of Canada has given them a lot to be proud of here. But yeah! 59 is now a PGA Tour Well, with most of the world's best players in contention, Lori Kane is the survivor this week. Lori never forgot her roots on the island. She founded the Lori Kane Charity Golf Classic, which has raised over a million dollars for local charities. This is going to be Mike Weir's Masters. He's two putts away from the green jacket. The green jacket is going north of the border. Mike Weir has won the Masters. Canada has its first ever major championship. Well, this is really special, Mike. We just saw the photo of you at Augusta and to see the Golden Bear and Arnie behind you and you're in Salt Lake. Thank you for joining us. Uh, We're going over to Florida. There's Lori Kane, who's joining us and Adam Hadwin's in Kansas. And it's just a treat. And what the greatest joy at the beginning was to see uh, Adam and Lori, you're all friends. Uh, But the question was for Michelle's Brielle. So over to you, Mike. Uh, Tell us about what happened and, and the good news today. Well, yes. Uh, for those of you who don't know, yeah, my, uh, my girlfriend's daughter uh, had a bad skateboarding accident uh, almost a month ago now. And um, she's really recovered really well. The last couple of weeks, she was in a induced coma for a couple of weeks um, and kind of scary, very scary for a long time. But uh, she's really progressed really well. And she's actually coming home today. So we're, we're having uh, big smiles on her face and uh, have a little celebration for her today um, that she gets to come home. She's still got a long road ahead, a number of different therapies, occupational therapies and things, but uh, she gets to come home. No surprise, Lori was the brave one to ask that question right out of the gate, uh, Lori. So thank you for that. Adam, you and Mike, uh, President's Cup Australia, you both are on fire right now. You're coming into a big year and to have coronavirus put the uh, halt on that, I know would be tough, but just tell me about the relationship you have, the two of you, Adam, you and Mike. Yeah, um, I think it's really kind of blossomed since that first President's Cup in 2017. Um, I'm the team. He was the assistant, one of the assistant captains. And um, we got to, we got to spend some quality time with each other. Um, I still remember kind of the first time that I actually spent some time with Mike was during a rain delay or a fog delay at Torrey Pines. And I got to pick his brain a little bit. And we were back-to-back groups just kind of waiting it out. But um, it's – to have somebody like Mike to be able to look up to who's, who's still playing the game and, and who's still around so much to be able to pick his brain and um, basically just kind of hang around. Um, he's, you know, arguably one of the greatest players we've had in Canada. And um, it's, it's great to have somebody to look up to and, and um, spend time with. And Mike, I'll flip you over to Laurie Kane. I'll ask you about Laurie because you're both ambassadors, obviously, as great Canadian golfers. Uh, I'll just ask you. Lori Kane, when I say that, what it comes to mind? What well, comes to mind? Uh, what a great person. Um, you know, I go back with Lori back to the early 90s, you know, when I was just kind of coming up the Canadian Tour ranks. And there was an event in Florida uh, called the J.C. Penny Classic, which was a, a guy from the regular tour and, and an LPGA Tour player. And Lori asked me to play, even though I wasn't on the PGA Tour yet. And uh, 
which was which was a great honor uh, to play in that event. It was such a fun event. It's too bad it's still not going, but we just we just hit it off from the get go. Played that event for a couple of years and um, just had a ball and became great friends uh, from that moment forward. And Lori, uh, your connection to these two boys. Well, they're golfers and they like hockey. <laughs> what else can I say? Um, <laughs> no, I remember making the call to Mike when, Ron, when I wanted to play in the JCPenney and um, I had called the tournament director and I said, look, I don't really have anybody but Mike Weir and I think he's going to tour school. He's going to get through tour school. And then hey, can I invite him? Because it was our pick that year. Um, and that was so much fun. We, I learned a lot. Um, definitely Danny gave me uh, the advice that you need to go work on your wedge game because, you know, you've just played with one of the best guys in the world with a wedge game. Um, I do remember the 16th hole at Copperhead. I think it's a par five up the hill. And Mike, I hit my drive, so he has to hit my shot. And he said, how close do you want to be? And I said, I, like, I don't care. I don't have a favorite number. <laughs> and he busts this thing, 265 off the ground, three wood, right up on the fringe. I mean, I didn't chip in, but we made birdie. <laughs> Gosh, we could go hockey direction, but I'll save that for a second. Uh, I did mention in the preamble the relationship between the caddy. You know, I was with Lori, you guys, uh, over at Magna when Brooke Anderson and Brittany were doing their thing this summer. And, you know, Lori's like, right? She's uh, the queen going around introducing me to everybody, but I just couldn't get over that dynamic. And you've had it twice, Mike, in the case of uh, Brennan and then Rob, and obviously Joe for you, Adam, and Danny Sharp, obviously Lori mentioned. So that to me is one of the great unwritten stories of professional sports is caddy and golfer. Uh, I'll start with you, Adam. Tell me your story about the connection and how it works. Yeah, um, it's really not just about finding numbers and, and getting the best number, I think. As players, we could do that ourselves. Most of what goes into caddying is, like you mentioned, that relationship, when to when to speak up, when to stay quiet, when to offer advice, when to just let the player go. Um, and that's a difficult thing to, to get. And I think, you know, I'm sure Mike and, and Lori would echo the same thing. When you find somebody that sort of gets that and understands it and adds that piece to the puzzle, you, you can't let it go. Um, you know, oftentimes when you struggle, you may seem to think that, you know, the grass is greener on the other side. And, and, but I think if you think that you, you really understand that it, it probably isn't. And, um, you know, when you get, when you get somebody good, you got to hold on to them. Joe Cruz was with you when you score the 59th eighth player in history to do it. And then he's a few weeks later trying to guide yeah. you to that first PGA victory. Do you have a memory of yeah. anything that happened between you? Um, well, the 59 was honestly fairly like nothing changed that day. And I think that's, what the greatest thing it was and, and one of the best things about Joe and I describe him as kind of the Southern California surfer dude. Um, you know, he, he's just got such a laid back personality, happy, friendly, um, like chill. And so that was really great during uh, that stretch of the 59. Uh, nothing changed. Um, he, you could tell that he wasn't getting excited about what was going on. Um, I remember mentioning him to him on hole 12, kind of joking with him when I went to nine under and I said, all right, we only got four more to go, buddy. He goes, let's just worry about the next tee shot. And, um, you know, that's just kind of his attitude. And uh, it's been great over the last six years now. And, and uh, hopefully we can continue strong moving forward. Brennan Little was an arch rival in golf as a kid. And then you have Rob Roxborough, who mm -hmm. I love in his Team Canada hockey sweaters, Mike. So, I, again, the dynamic, what, what is it that makes that click? Well, Adam said uh, a lot of the things there, you know, Brennan, you know, was it was a childhood friend for me, you know, we competed against each other in junior golf, um, grew up together. Um, and then, you know, we were playing the Canadian tour and, and he just kind of got tired of, of chasing it. And so I offered them a job and, and what Brennan brought was similar to what Joe uh, brings for Adam. It's just the right thing, saying the right thing at the right time. I relay a story at the Masters when I, I birdied 15 to, to pull tied for the lead and I was walking to the 16th pole and there was, you know, a lot of, a lot of cheering going on and noise. And Brennan just said, Hey, Mike, you know, we got three holes to go. Would you have taken at the beginning of the week, three holes to go, you're tied for the lead. And I said, absolutely. And uh, he's like, let's, let's get it done then. And it just, just those little things in the right uh, words and, and moments. He's also can able, able to in between shots, talk about hockey, different sports to take your mind away from the game. So it's that 
psychologist, uh, besides being a caddy, they they can be, you know, a great psychologist to keep you in the right frame of mind. And Brendan's great at that. And he's doing a great job with Gary Woodland as well. Obviously winning an open, you know, I, I, the thing about that uh, masters, they just played it on TSN uh, recently and to watch it all again, uh, I go back to 13. I'm sure Adam, Hey Adam, you were 15 years old when that <laughs> happened in 2003. Where were you? Um, I would have been in Abbotsford. I would assume, um, trying to trying to become what Mike was at that point for sure. Yeah. So on 13, he's gone over the green and he's on a down slope and he's got downhill with the water facing him on the other side of the green and he picks his putter out of the bag and he would actually kind of blow it by because how couldn't you uh, and then drain the putt uh, from 15 feet the other way. Uh, that, that to me, you know, you never had Brennan around you lining up putts, but that decision mm -hmm. to me really stood out watching that final round again. Well, that was, a, that was a critical point in the, in the round. I, I seen the board that uh, Len Matisse was out in front and was on fire, you know, seven or eight under for the day. And, uh, you know, I knew, you know, I needed to make birdie on 13. If you don't birdie 13 in the final round when you're behind, it's, it's tough to make up ground on the other hole. So I knew that was important for me to, uh, um, to make birdie there. Yeah, and the reason I chose putter is because my ball had gone up against a little seam that was, you know, there was a, a – you won't call it a rough cut at Augusta because it's not, not really rough out there, but just a little higher grass and then, and then the fringe. So my ball was right against the seam and obviously going downhill. If I, if I chip that, it could come out kind of fast or dead. So I thought the putter was a safer play to at least give me a chance to uh, have a run at that birdie putt. What an up and down. And that uh, Masters becomes your sixth comeback victory. Amazing. Uh, Laurie, you're the same. You're, you've got, like Adam and Mike, that hockey spirit. But you've got a guy that came out of a car crash to become <laughs> one of the great uh, companions as caddy of all time. So tell me about him. Yeah. Um, well, I met Danny um, as he was rehabilitating to try to get back to playing. Danny played the Canadian Tour and actually was one of the founding guys that threw some money to Boschman way back when to, to, to kind of put the thing together. And um, I think what Danny brought to me was I didn't travel very much other than, you know, what I experienced playing some mini tour golf here in Florida, getting started the Maurier series. So everything was home Canadian base and he had traveled the world. He played South America, Australia, um, chasing it. And um, I, I'll say this even today, there is not a day in the 25 years that I've known this guy that I haven't learned something new about the game that I didn't know. And we joked uh, just the other day, I was talking to him. I haven't seen him in a couple months. He's, he's down south. And uh, I said, Danny, do you remember in Atlanta we we're playing? And I said, here, let me hold the bag. Get in there and tell me what kind of shot you were going to hit. So we watched the video of that. And the commentators saying, well, here you go. The caddy's going to hit this shot. <laughs> and it was, it was things like that that made it easy for me. Um, I know getting across the finish line the very first time was uh, an unbelievable experience. And, and I owe a lot to Danny because like Brennan, like Joel, they kept me, Danny kept me right here. He didn't let me get too far ahead, but he wasn't afraid um, to put his foot up my butt if I needed it. So um, I'm still learning from them today. You know, the sacred ground, St. Andrews, Augusta, you have each of you a sacred ground. In your case, it's Belvedere and PEI. And I should give reference to Brutonell, where Jack started your dad as a coach there too. Pro. Yep. Uh, Mike, obviously here on Oaks, uh, Brights Grove. And then over in the case of Ledgeview is like, well, let's start with Adam Ledgeview. This is, like, <laughs> this is to me like McKinnon and Crosby coming out of Coal Harbor, Nova Scotia. What is with Ledgeview? Uh, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, it, it is a pretty incredible story. Um, I remember playing with Nick. It might've been for the first time together on tour, uh, at colonial and we were paired with BJ Singh and I get announced from Abbotsford BC and then Nick gets announced from Abbotsford BC. And he kind of just looked at us both like with this silly grin on his face, like, seriously. <laughs> um, and so, it's, it's wild. I mean, Nick and I grew up 10 minutes apart. Um, we went to different high schools, but we're a year in age different. Grew up at the same golf course. Uh, and it's not just us. I mean, James Lepp, Ray Stewart, a um, number of guys. So I, I don't know. I mean, of course, it's only 6,300 yards. Um, so you wouldn't think that it would produce, uh, you know, PJ Tour players. But it, it's built on the side of a hill. It's got small greens. Um, you know, I remember playing them firm and fast. You got to be very specific. And so 
Um, one of the great things that I remember growing up was just going out at six, seven o'clock at night in the summer times when the course is dying out and going down the first hole and just chipping around greens. And I'd play three or four holes and I would just spend time chipping around the greens. They, they were good green complexes. Uh, the fairways were tree lined, so you had to hit it straight. Otherwise, you had to learn how to punch out. And um, that's probably why my punch out game is so strong as well. <laughs> Well, your dad, Jerry, too, right? Uh, he, he deserves wow. so much credit. I was watching presidents, him and Bryson's dad, uh, <laughs> on those ATV spectator vehicles to having a race. Tell me about, uh, about him, Jerry. Yeah, no, he's a who. Obviously, I've got incredible parents that um, supported my drive for, for anything, really. I mean, I grew up playing soccer and baseball. Um, they transported me everywhere. They were behind me every step of the way. There was no pushing at all to do anything to get involved in golf, even though my dad was a golf pro for 25 years and is still in the golf business. Um, there was, there was never any pressure from him to do it. It all came from me. And if I wanted to do it, I could ask. And we certainly went head to head. Sometimes we had some battles um, about some things. We learned quickly that maybe the father son coaching was probably not for us, but um, you know, as the years have gone on and, and um, it's definitely a lot more of a supportive role and, and it's obviously great to have him there and his knowledge of the game and, and that stuff. And yeah, he's just, he's a character. Um, when I saw, when he showed me that video of him racing Bryson's dad, I mean, it, it's one of the funniest things I think I've ever seen in my life. And I hope people got a crack out of it. And um, that's just him. That's just who he is. He makes friends wherever he goes. Um, he's always the life of the party and, um, you know, people are drawn to him. My uh, thanks to Dan Murphy out in uh, Vancouver for forwarding that to me. It was amazing <laughs> to see your dad win the race. Very important. We, uh, he did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Mike, uh, take us over to here. I cannot believe uh, that as a boy, Jack Nicholas played at your little course. So yeah, over to you. Yeah. Here on Oaks sounds except for the hillside, uh, like Ledgeview, uh, similar course sounds like, you know, 6,300 yards. Front nine kind of open, some good par threes. The back nine was very tree-lined, and you had to curve the ball around, big dog legs. But, uh, yeah, Jack Nicholas came in 1983 to do an exhibition with my head pro, Steve Bennett. And, you know, I got to see the Golden Bear up close when I was 13 years old. And, and later that summer, uh, I, think, I think it was either later that summer or the following, I went to my first Canadian Open. So that was a big introduction to see, you know, the greatest player of all time was the first real PGA Tour Pro that I that I saw up close, so that was really cool. But uh, you know, I think the thing about Huron Oaks is that we had all of us guys that worked in the back shop cleaning the range. We were all very competitive. There was about eight or nine of us, and if we weren't working, we were always on the course competing against one another, playing, going to the tennis courts that we had and playing tennis on the putting green. There was a big spotlight off the clubhouse that uh, that uh, shone down on the on the green, and we'd putt till ten o'clock at night until our parents made us come home. So it was kind of that atmosphere and that competitive atmosphere that uh, here on Oaks brought. It was a, it was a great uh, uh, life to grow up as a kid. I worked in the pro shop and I was also greenskeeper at uh, Balmoral in Red Deer. And I remember the McGregor rep coming in. I love Nicholas too. You actually wrote him. I can't yeah. believe you wrote to Jack to say, should I stay as a lefty, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I had the McGregor rep and I'm, you know, making his ears bleed with stories about forged versus cast irons and, you know, cavity backs and wound balls. And I think I know a lot, of course, I knew nothing, but he gave me a McGregor a t-shirt and I just thought I would, you know, I had met Jack Nicholas, but I hadn't. Uh, Lori, you bring me over to PEI. This is a uh, beautiful. Well, I'm hearing these stories um, about the, well, I think what golf, I won't tell you anything other than golf was in what we did in the summer. And then I played every other sport. Um, I don't, I think Mike knew I was a synchronized swimmer. I don't know. What I did. <laughs> so, people ask me all the time, why do you smile so much? And I said, well, in swimming, we were judged on it. I had no other answer for them. Um, but I'm hearing this, you know, Ron, and I'm, what I'm thinking right now is um, I'm, I'm well into the back nine of my career here and wondering why we're missing um, junior golf, particularly in my area. I mean, we have lots of kids playing golf, but they're not playing golf. They're competing at golf. They're, they're playing junior tournaments, um, more tournaments than I ever thought I could probably play at their age. And I think that's why we're losing um, good quality. Like I've worked in the back shop. I played with the guys in the back shop. We were either cleaning clubs or hitting balls. And now everything is so structured um, to a point where I think it's, I think it's hurting us. Um, I know I'm going back to, to PEI here shortly. And I've been told by the Maple Leaf Junior Tour that 
nobody's playing competitive golf in PEI, no juniors. Now I want them to compete, but I want them to have fun doing it. So I have a new program with uh, up at Mill River on the west end of the island, and we have a three-hole academy um, that I think is going to be perfect for kids to just go out and play with their families and, and get this game back to families, at least in my side of the world. Um, I spent a lot of time, Adam, in BC at Shaughnessy. I was very fortunate in the, in the mid-late 90s uh, to work with Jack McLaughlin at Shaughnessy, and we're going to be bringing the CP Women's Open there in August, or well, Labor Day weekend, fingers crossed. Yeah. That, that we could get through all of this stuff. But um, I love hearing the stories about you two getting at your games. And um, I hope that we can get kids back to just playing to have fun. And then maybe they want to be one of us. I'm glad you brought up Sean. And by the way, Laurie, that's great. Three subjects kind of contained in that. It's so beautiful. Uh, let's go to the lower mainland for a second. I was uh, at the Cortinal Classic over on the island when you were doing the RBC in 2011, Adam, which is kind of a breakout moment. Big, big deal. Yeah. Why don't you reflect on that? Yeah. Um, I was, was there, different. by the way. <laughs> were you? Yes. Um, yeah, it, it was a big moment for me. Um, you know, I, I, I think back to some of the press conferences that I did uh, after, after rounds and getting into contention kind of making the joke well I'm just a Canadian tour player who am I um and and that really was how I felt at the time um I was you know I, I had played Canadian tour for 2010 I didn't improve my status I was playing Canadian tour again in 2011 and um here I was on the big stage uh final group of a Canadian open in what is basically my home city um you know an hour outside of Abbotsford and I'm getting to do what I love and, and just an incredible moment. Um, I'll never forget that walk up 18 being serenaded with O Canada, even though I wasn't going to win. Um, and, uh, but you know, it looked like I was going to be out of it early. Um, you know, I four of the eighth hole and, and it, it looked like disaster was going to strike and kind of fought back on the back nine and, and really had a chance to do it. Um, I can remember walking, I birdied the, I want to say it was 14, the short one. I made like a 30, I hit a, I laid up off the tee, hit a terrible wedge shot in the green, like 30 feet short. And I made this long putt and <laughs> you know, the crowd is kind of a, a tucked in. I mean, Shaughnessy's pretty tucked in in general, but mm -hmm. it, it gathers around the back of that green pretty well. And it echoes hard and the crowd went crazy. And um, I remember walking from 14 to 15 and David Faraday was with our group and he kind of looked at me and says, you, you've got a chance here. Keep going. And, um, you know, for even for even David at that point to say something to me um, was pretty cool and obviously came up a couple short, but um, something that, you know, outside of, you know, maybe the birth of my daughter or my first win or something, I mean, it's, it's right in the top moments of my career um, and one that I think set me on a good path. Actually, uh, RBC is going to St. George's where you had played the previous year, right, Adam? So, Mike, I know yeah. this is a, a kind of a two-part question, but the Air Canada 99, I go back to the lower mainland and what it meant to you. Uh, and then you can kind of take me into your year here where you're about to launch champions. You got the masters, not going to be till November now, but you, you know, it's a big time for you. Yeah. Yeah. 99. That was uh, my first, it was my second year on the PGA tour and my first win. And um, it had come at a great time. I, I, I think it was about three weeks earlier that I was in the final group of the PGA championship with tiger and had a, had a really difficult day, but I learned a lot that day. And, um, and I, what I remember about getting myself back in contention with a, a good round on Saturday um, is that, you know, I remember to kind of just stay within myself Sunday round, another, another chance to try to win. And I bogeyed the first hole Sunday again. And instead of kind of getting a little bit frust, flustered and trying to press to get that shot back early, I was just more relaxed, I think, coming off that uh, what I had, uh, you know, dealt with uh, three weeks earlier. And I just kind of settled in and ended up playing a great round and, and got my first victory. And and to have it happen in, in Canada and Vancouver and, um, you know, the long putt I made or the shot I hold on 14, I made a long putt on 16 and the crowd was fantastic. It was, it's really memorable still. One thing about the 80, uh, Wayne Gretzky called it. it makes for a good story, but I bet it was a nice story for you. Oh yeah. I mean, unbelievable. He, um, right after that final round, I remember Ben Crenshaw saying, Hey, today wasn't your best day, but uh, you're going to be there again. And, you know, when you hear words from, you know, people you look up to and, and then Wayne called later that night and said, hey, Mike, you know, I know you're disappointed about today. And he, he relayed the story of 
how they went against the Islanders, you know, those years and got, and got beaten up and how they learned and how they learned how the Islanders wanted a little bit more and they sacrificed a little bit more and how the team learned. Um, and I, I took that to heart and, um, and it really helped me that uh, when I was in Vancouver there for that first win. So that's Gretzky's job. Uh, Messier was your influence, Laurie. Tell the viewer about that. <laughs> and I, poor mess. And I only met him once. Um, I was just hearing that story. My, I went home. Um, I've been told I was too nice to win. I didn't have enough grit. Um, all kinds of things. Um, Rotella said, just keep doing what you're doing and everything will be fine. But I was on PEI when um, mess got traded from Vancouver back to the Rangers and I didn't originally see the press conference and Danny sent me a note said you need to watch the press conference Mark talked about winning being an attitude and so I got on a plane the next week went to St. Louis and that was my mantra for the whole week um, I remember coming up on Sunday we had a three-hour delay uh, to get playing and then subsequently we were going to Ottawa to play the last De Maurier. Um, so I ended up winning and this woman came up to me and she said, this is your week. And I looked right at her and I can see your face even today. And I said, you know what? Yeah, I'm the only one that can do something about me getting across the finish line. But, um, mess, I then got to meet Mark, um, several years later and of all places, Prince Edward Island at the old Dublin pub. <laughs> <laughs> and he, I was afraid to meet him. Um, you remember Don Brown, chairman of De Maurier, uh, was wanting to get him to come to De Maurier uh, that, for that last uh, year. And I said, no, 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 you can't do that. Um, I, not fair to him. And I, like, I was afraid he couldn't live up to my expectations. Well, he surpassed them. He was a total gentleman. Um, we hung out. We had a beer. And like Gretzky, he talked about things that we can, as athletes, that we can do and um, – you know, the winning is an attitude and we all know it is. Uh, and that got me across the finish line in St. Louis for sure. He, he's like Mike. He's a peaceful warrior that uh, Mark Messier, uh, very Zen-like, but just, you know, the ferocity mm -hmm. speaks for itself. And, you know, Adam, that's kind of your thing. Your love of hockey is well known to uh, Canucks fans. Uh, yeah. You actually made it a point to see the Sedins finale, right? While you're in the middle of the Masters. Yeah, um, they've meant so much to the city of Vancouver. And, uh, you know, my hockey viewing and, um, and not just their contribution on the ice. I mean, obviously everybody knows the records and, and, you know, they were rightfully retired to the rafters, but, um, their contributions to the city, uh, they're great stewards, uh, for the team. And, um, you know, I try, I try and watch as many hockey games as possible when I'm on the road. Uh, sometimes the East coast, West coast thing doesn't work out very well in my favor, but, um, you know, that, that wasn't a game that I was, I was going to try and miss, um, they're just, they're just special people and, and they've meant a lot to to the hockey world to vancouver to the vancouver canucks and um i want to make sure i was i was watching it it was it was a bit of an emotional moment to, to not ever see him play hockey again. and there again uh, they remind me of peaceful warriors don't they mike so let's close uh we could go on for hours uh you know i just go back to being a boy and loving the game and uh, I bought my first set, $500 set. I couldn't afford that. So I worked in the shop, as I mentioned. I got wholesale price, $30 an iron, 45 These were power belts. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I bought, my first club was a six iron. And my last was a five wood. And they became my two favorite clubs, as fate would have it. Uh, just a reflection on the psychology of, uh, as Mike, you would say, finding your love in what you do. Uh, you mm -hmm. first, Mike Weir. Advice for uh, Adam and for young golfers. What would it be? Oh, boy. Advice for Adam. Well, I, I, you know, I think what he's doing, you know, to speak just to Adam, what he's doing, he's, he's a very disciplined guy, you know, getting to know him through the, through the president's cup. You can tell he very analytical and, and assessing his game, but he has fun playing and he's, he lets his game come out. You know, you don't, when you play, you don't want to be too over analytical or with your technique. You want to, um, you want to let that kind of come out and, and, and be more on your, on your right brain, I guess, instead of your left brain when you're playing the game. But I think he does all the things behind the scenes where you can be in your left vein and, and work on the, on the certain things you want to work on, whether that's wedge game putting, he does all that work. And then when he plays, he plays. And I think that's the best advice you can give for a junior golfer is like, there's time to work on technique. There's time to work on your chipping and putting and focus on whatever little flaws you have. But then when you go play, you have to turn it over and you have to get creative and you have to visualize shots and you have to, um, play the game 
And I think that's that's the thing that, you know, as Lori and I were, as Lori was saying earlier about, you know, getting out to play and have fun and hit shots. I'm, I remember at Huron Oaks, you know, hitting shots over trees and trying all these crazy putts and playing cross country golf from the first hole to the ninth green and trying all this fun stuff. If you can kind of bring that, um, that level of fun, even though it's our profession, out onto professional golf, I think you have great success. And while we still work on these things, you got to still have fun out there. Adam, you go second. Your advice. Yeah, I mean, I would kind of echo what Lori was talking about earlier and, and trying to inject some of that fun back. I, I agree with her completely. I think the seriousness that people are taking at such a young age now, they get burnt out too quickly and they lose the, the fun aspect of it. I grew up playing other sports with golf being for fun. And, um, you know, I think back to when I was, I was very fortunate at Ledgy to have other people that were interested in the game and, and I could go play with. But as juniors, we just went out and, competed against each other and had fun you know whether it be through up and downs or putting matches on the putting green whatever you can do it wasn't we weren't out playing a ton of tournaments every year but we were playing against each other it was fun you know you wanted to beat your friend and um i had, i credit a lot of that with the success i'm having now well even valspar when you win uh, you and jessica are planning your honeymoon and that goes uh, out the window when you win and you got to go to the <laughs> right uh, but, and now you have a baby daughter so i, I would assume there's a uh, you know, that's Success fun isn't the word. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, Laurie. <laughs> but right, it helps to have balance in your life. Uh, would you agree, Adam? Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, it, 100%. And I, I love my downtime. I put the clubs up for a little bit. I get away from the game. It makes you miss it more, too. It makes you bring back a little bit of that fire. Um, makes you practice a little bit harder. All that sort of stuff. Um, it's huge. And like Lori and Mike, I grew up, and, and you, Ron, I grew up similar, working in the back shop, doing all sorts of different things. And, um, you know, it, it creates that. If you just grind yourself out, and, and, and um, I think you can just grow tired of the game. And if you do that for too long, you just give it up. And that's obviously not what we want to see. And Lori's uh, smile, as she mentions, legendary. But Lori, your fight is also legendary. So in 92, you go to Marine Drive and you play. You hit a three-wood off the tee when you had to fight your way onto Team Canada for the World Amateur. Uh, it's yes. a complicated, long story we don't have to get into. But you had to fight your way onto that team as you deserve to be. And you felt the pressure, all the pressure in the world. And, and somehow you took on either your father's... Uh, you know, <laughs> whatever it was you 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 had a um, spirit of fight uh, yeah thanks ron and i you know there are things that define you and and sometimes i think that um probably will be something that defines me um i know a lot of people don't talk about that situation anymore which i'm glad of but what i wanted was an answer why you know i followed the rules um as athletes we want to know what it takes to become part of a team or, or what have you. And when someone goes into a boardroom and change the rules um, in your backswing, that's not right. So um, I've come a long way from that, but I, there are days when um, that gets me to the range because I wanna keep doing what I'm doing. Um, I personally right now am so excited for Mike Weir that he is getting out onto the champions tour because you're gonna, <laughs> Like, I can't, I better not swear, but you're going to be taking names there, buddy. I am excited to watch. Um, I know how hard you work. I, like we talked early in the show, um, I was beside you. I know the determination that you have. And I know that the love of the game that you still have. So um, I cheer both of you on and all of the guys. Um, I'm, I don't know when my time will be up. Unfortunately, our side of Champions Golf isn't as quite as uh, lucrative as yours is, Mike. Um, but we will have some things coming down the pipeline for 21. And uh, I'm going to still keep playing. Um, and I encourage everybody else out there to, to take up the game and love the game. Um, and follow all these young Canadians that are doing so well. And then don't forget about a couple of old ones either. <laughs> Did you want a last word, Mike? <laughs> Yeah, Lori. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm very excited for the Champions Tour. Um, you know, I still love the game. I mean, I love it. I love the the grind. I love practicing. And like Lori, I'm on the on the back nine of my career as well. But uh, you know, we have this Champions Tour, which I'm I'm really looking forward to. And you know, just you know, I wish Lori and Adam the best. You know, I follow all the Canadians. You know, I keep a keen eye now because I've been part of the Presence Cup on Adam and and the other Canadian guys, but. I also do the women's game as well. And, you know, I've always been a big fan of Lori and 
and obviously Brooke, what she's doing has been incredible. So, um, you know, we're, we're just fortunate to play a sport that we can play for a long time and, and enjoy and play with our friends as well. So I'm enjoying that aspect of my game a lot more too. So, um, you know, it's great to be a golfer these days. Adam, Laurie, Mike, incredible. Thank you. What a treat to have the golfers. We're back Monday, 7 o'clock Eastern and 4 Pacific in conversation with Wesley Schultz of the Lumineers and Toronto Maple Leaf defenseman Tyson Berry. And speaking of hockey, the golfers all love the game. Of course, NHL Classics with Wayne Gretzky. I want to point out Saturday evening, 7 ET, 4 Pacific. That's on Sportsnet. Wayne Gretzky and the Los Angeles Kings against the Montreal Canadiens. Our song lyric to close today for a Friday, something fun. I'm all right. Don't nobody worry about me. You gotta give me a fight. Why don't you just let me be? From Caddyshack, the great Kenny Loggins. Thanks for watching. So long for now.